this isn't the most beautiful photo, but it's one of my favorites from a recent site visit to Rwanda in August. This is an operating room in a place called Ruli, and I like this photo because there's so many little details in it that tell the story of life in rural areas. And you might not notice it at first, but I think the most interesting thing in this photo is this, or for clarity, this. The lives of tens of thousands of people that use this hospital are in the hands of equipment from World War II, which is not some weird ironic incident specific to Rwanda. The New York Times article quotes 96% of foreign donated equipment to developing countries is just never used. Um, and this applies to a range of well-meaning products um, designed or donated to lift people out of poverty. Wind turbines, cooking stoves, solar panels, abandoned. And why does this happen? The answer to that question can be complex, political, systemic, all of those things that makes us as an individual feel kind of powerless. Or we could look at that question through a design lens. The golden rule of design Oh, right, I'm sorry. Before I go into that, this is actually sitting next to that operating room right next door, um, collecting a fine layer of dust. It's the latest and greatest equipment we use here in the United States, which is fairly crazy and weird. So the golden rule of design, thou shalt not design for thyself, which is quite hard, actually. I mean, especially in our culture where things tend to be about the individual. But imagine for a second that you all have a piece of Play-Doh in your hands, and I asked you to... Um, shape me a beverage container to ease my morning commute. Chances are pretty high that you might shape something sort of like um, a coffee mug, and you'd be shaping out your handle with your specific hand shape. It's a handle that I would probably never use because I um, hold my mug like this. And I was going to use this as my... I don't have enough hands to shape, but I don't really use the handle. And I don't burn my hands because I don't drink hot beverages in the morning. But perhaps you do. Maybe you drink coffee or tea, and it's an integral part to your morning routine. And you can't help but assume the same of me. And that's the sort of thinking that kind of gets us into trouble. Thou shalt not design for thyself. It means, it means you're designed for your user. You put yourself into their shoes. It means that the golden rule of design is empathy. So now if we look back at this hospital equipment, this time past the technology into a user, this is Jacqueline. She is the hospital technician, very smart, educated woman. She speaks Kenya, Rwanda, and French. Jacqueline lives in a 230-volt, red, dusty world built on concrete where the nearest screw head is a two-and-a-half-hour drive away. In her world, a delicate 110-volt piece of equipment with instructions in English is kind of a joke, whereas equipment that's rugged, that's designed for lack of access to tools, that can handle extreme fluctuations in temperature. That makes sense. World War II equipment makes sense. But this process that we just went through to understand why World War II equipment makes sense, that's the sort of thinking that's lacking in the development industry. And it's certainly this lack of real human consideration that hinders promising technologies like cooking stoves and hospital equipment from their intended impact. In general, I feel like the lack of empathy the lack of empathy and the continued existence of poverty are kind of like cause and effect. Our solution to need in Rwanda was to send them equipment, equipment that we now know had zero impact. We didn't improve the situation. Um, I'm sorry, I just had a brain fart. <laughs> I also had a glass of white wine before coming up here, so that might have helped. All right, so we didn't improve the situation. We didn't, um, we don't create lasting change by sympathy alone. Sympathy is what leads us to design stuff and donate stuff without understanding the consequences of that. And it's certainly that sort of thinking that has affected poverty here in the US as well. These are photos that I took last month, this time when I was back at home in northern Arizona. Just off of I-40, we have masses of people living in makeshift homes, walking two miles to collect contaminated water in old milk jugs. Entire communities living in darkness without access to electricity, using a wooden shack as a toilet. In extremely rural areas where it's difficult to access the modern world, 
In the 1850s, the U.S. government moved Native peoples from their homes in exchange for an annual payment for survival, a decision that was made without any understanding of the long-term outcomes and certainly without any real human consideration. And now, over 150 years later, our reservations are the most poverty-stricken and um, overlooked population in the United States. The unemployment rate on the Navajo Nation is 50% higher at times, and the per capita income is less than $8,000. Poverty and our ability to effect effectively address it has nothing to do with our physical proximity to it, because these are our neighbors next door. Yet, emotionally, we are so distant from one another. The reality is empathy is kind of like a muscle, a muscle that is atrophied for many of us. And if we're going to effectively address issues like poverty and inequality, we have to flex this muscle. Um, and to do that, we have to kind of break out of these bubbles. It's certainly a bubble that I know that I'm in. We have to break out of these bubbles that shield us from realities like this. And by better connecting ourselves with other people, the objects we design, new technologies, can be more effective for billions of people everywhere. Um, so when I get to travel around the world, what I get to do is to ask people what they want. And the most popular answer I get, whether I'm on the Navajo Nation or in very rural Rwanda, is better roads. And this, to me, kind of explains why cell phones are these worldwide technology success story. Cell phones address one of these universal basic human values, accessibility. So to finish up, empathy ultimately makes us better designers, not just of physical objects, but of, of policy, of legislation, um, of systems. In some sense, I guess I could say we are all designers. And good design that respects that golden rule is a vehicle towards poverty alleviation. So <laughs> kind of a blessing if I had a few minutes with a guaranteed audience to leave a singular message, I would say uh, do something on a daily basis to flex your empathy muscles. Because in the end, I mean, we are not powerless people. And the more intimate we become with the communities and issues around us, the more powerful we in fact become. And I guess I would say, you know, do so I'm not telling everybody they need to change the world and it doesn't have to be your personal mission, but just reach outside your bubble and touch whatever's closest to you. Flex your empathy muscles.